be talking to some of our favorite cable stars like Lynn from Warrior Vision and Sophie the Dog. But first, she must play. See? You feel as if your life is in complete control. All of your bills are paid. All of your relationships are neat. trying to do the news, tell y'all the news, ma'am. Queen Elizabeth went out to California, and some politician felt her back when he was supposed to be showing her some painted pictures. The rest of the time, it rained, and Queen Elizabeth thought that was real funny because it rains all the time in England. This man feeling her back was the worst thing that's happened to the royal family since Jimmy Carter kissed her mother, and then Ireland blew up Lord Mountbatten. Y'all trying to get me to turn around again? We're going to be doing that again this week. Princess Carolyn has started wearing her mama's clothes, but they don't fit her. Because she ain't never going to be as big as Princess Grace was. Her mama, y'all remember, was Princess Grace, but died a while back. I come to find out it was extra strength town oil, which is poison and pear salinger and all that mess. We did some report on it. Tennessee Williams, who wrote a bunch of plays that are real hard to make any sense out of, has died. They said it's because he choked on the bottle cap that he was trying to swallow. But there's some that say there's a bunch more of them in there that he did swallow, and that was something that he just did all the time. So we're probably going to be doing some more investigative reportage on that. Mark Kostabi doesn't 
paint his own pictures anymore. He has just published, at his own expense, a massive tome of his early works. And hello, he's only 30. This and other antics have earned him the nickname King Khan. So we went down to his painting factory to meet the hype meister and learn all about his plans to erect the tallest building in the world. Kastavi World is um, a studio where 45 people work. About 25 of them are painters. Three of them are idea people. There's a bookkeeper, there's people who stretch canvas, there's the miscellaneous people, there's even a rhetorician, someone who I hired to write a one-page analysis, or a rhetoric, if you will, about each painting. The idea people uh, generate ideas based on whatever they want to do at times. Sometimes they, uh, the ideas are triggered by memorandums, memorandums that I um, fax into the think tank when I'm out of town or something, or from my apartment, or when I come in and I write up something. And uh, sometimes they react to current events. Then the, the editorial committee comes by and sifts through them to decide whether it's worthy of becoming a painting or whether it should be rejected. And then the paintings are executed here on the... When they're finished, they go down for a uh, final approval before they're titled, also by committee, and then signed by me. Let's look over here at this painting, which is um, a black and white of Mark as Napoleon. And um, even though he did mention to us that he was out of his megalomaniac mode, and into a new one. Um, and he is pointing to Kostabi Tower, his big project that he's going to build in Brooklyn. Kostabi World is, is uh, relatively autonomous. Things can get done here without my being here. So it frees me up. In other words, I have all the time in the world to do whatever I want. And what I've chosen to do is build this monument to creativity, which is uh, a 2,000 foot building, the world's tallest, devoted exclusively to art. And my uh, preferred site is a, is a 30 acre. Uh, piece of land on the waterfront in Greenpoint, Brooklyn, where I will make it this be an entire park from which the center will rise this gigantic tapering structural cage that will be interwoven with trees, gardens, forests, waterfalls, fountains, and the building will start one third or one half the way up, uh, which will contain museums, galleries, bookstores, residences, housing for artists, uh, art supply stores, theaters, uh, <coughs> etc. It will be a totally self-sufficient vertical art city. I really, I really want this to be one of my great statements and masterpieces that I leave behind. Like this book, this is sort of in keeping with it, a smaller version of Kostabi Tower. I mean, this is the kind of thing people would say, oh, you're crazy, no one's ever gonna, this is not gonna work. I, I spent like $400,000 putting this book together and that comes across that people really want this book. Not only do people clamor for it right now, but um, my dealers are advising me that it's going to be a collector's item worth $1,500 each. Kostabi, the early years which sells for $225. And we've been told that they've been selling like hotcakes, but it doesn't look like they have yet. They've got quite a few in here. An inevitable side effect of Kostabi Tower will, will uh, make me the most famous artist of all time and one of, the, one of the most famous people in the world as well. Here we are at uh, a bunch of paintings, and here's one with a man inflating his own head. Now, how about that?
my happy hour. You can have a happy hour almost anywhere. And I really have a ball because I enjoy the social season in New York in the spring and fall. And I go to Florida in the winter, both Miami and Palm Beach. And in the summertime, I go to the Hamptons. I'm at the wonderful Museum of Modern Art in New York City, and I'm at the lovely party in the garden. This is a lovely uh, Juan Miro painting, and it's uh, really uh, uh, making the uh, wall of the Museum of Modern Art look great. The Museum of Modern Art here in New York is really a fabulous place. They have a wonderful uh, escalator. I'm in front of a wonderful sculpture by uh, Gaston Lachette, and it's uh, really nice being up here on the second floor at the Museum of Modern Art. Uh, everybody is uh, running through the museum in their formal attire, and it kind of makes things quite exciting here in lovely New York. Here I am at the lovely Museum of Modern Art in front of uh, one of the most beautiful paintings in the world. It's a painting by uh, Claude Monet. And it's renowned, and I've known this painting for many years, and it's uh, one of the finest and freshest paintings ever done by uh, Claude Benet. <laughs> Should ordinary people, anybody at all, be allowed to get their hands on the airway? And if so, does this represent the end of civilization as we know it? And if it does, isn't that a good thing? We thought we'd ask some stars from cable TV to tell us about their work and their views. I'm going to start with 
Lynn Muscarella of Voyeur Vision, Hello. the nation's first um, telefantasy show. And I just want to ask you, Lynn, have you no shame? Yes, of course I have some shame, but I don't think that what we're doing in Voyeur Vision is shameful. I think what we're doing is a release of tension rather than attention giver. There are people out there who have secrets, who are inhibited. I mean, I talk to them, and I'm learning a lot really? from them, well, from but, my audience. Mm -hmm. But besides being like a counselor to these people, right? you also are like this little sex doll, and I just want to ask you between girls, do you ever like fake it, you know, like you're not really in the mood and have a talent? No, no. no. If I'm turned on, I'm turned on. Really? Yeah. Now let's talk to John Wallowich, who has a show called Wallowich, in which he sings and drinks. John, you look like you're pushing product. I am. Uh, I just got an offer from London this morning to, to release my albums in London, the United Kingdom, and Europe. So I, I'm going to do that, I think. Great. Now, let me now just... what, what, you say I drink. What does that mean? Well, you do <coughs> have your handy glass of scotch on your show no, no, quite no, no, a bit. No, 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 no. You're this iced tea. That's not iced tea. Well, yes, it is. Yes, this is iced tea. It's very weak. As a matter of fact, I'd like it to be freshened. You know, in England, they're eccentrics. But they, they're all hidden away in castles and funny places. But in America, eccentrics go into Manhattan Cable. So here Thank we are. You. It's so true. Now, speak Mark from My Craft Show. Thank you very much. <laughs> Tell me how you get some of the ideas to do your show, because obviously you're doing it all by yourself. Um, uh, the ideas just come from things that just happen to me every every month, you know, just things that happen in the holidays. Uh, I go home to North Dakota, you know, I do a lot of shows there with my family. Is and your family real proud of you? Uh, no, no. They're, they're not? <laughs> Are they ashamed of you? <laughs> no. They think my show's a little weird, and I'm a little weird, I think. But they, they, they're on it a lot. I don't think you're, you saw those clips, but um, I have a lot of fun with my show. That's great. This is Gregory from Gregory's Funhouse, and he brought along Filthy, who he's sort of <laughs> stimulating right now. Hello, everyone. My name is Gregory Ambrose Pittman, host of Gregory's Funhouse on Manhattan Cable Television. It is a pleasure to be here, here today with Filthy the dog. I don't mind playing second fiddle to Filthy. Really? I've struggled, I struggled for uh, two years now just to get a, just a wee bit of recognition. However, it seems that the star of the show is my puppy dog, Filthy. Gregory, do animal rights activists ever write you letters or call you up? That's true, Jane. Everybody says, uh, <laughs> says you know, uh, the dog is tormented. Uh, the dog uh, lies in its own garbage and filth. Well, of course, everybody knows who watches Gregory's Funhouse. Uh, they know that the, the show is the base with perversity, garbage. Uh, that's what we strive for, the lowest common denominator. And I think we achieve it week after week on Manhattan Cable Television. <laughs> it's true. It's so true. Jim, you do a little bit of that, too. This is Jim O'Neill from the Worldwide Bathtub Lecture Series, world famous. No one needs to lecture. There are so many topics out there that are unaddressed. Oh, it's as simple as that, really. Okay, you compose yourself. Let's meet Brenda and Glenda. First of all, I'm Brenda Sexual, and she's Glenda Orgasm. And our show is, um, our goal is to raise gay, lesbian, and drag queen visibility. We think it's very important to bring drag out of theaters and nightclubs and out into the public where people don't expect to run into drag queens. And also what we like to do is we like to make people question their own sort of gender notions of what men or women or whoever, you know, should wear or shouldn't wear, you know. Yeah, we're breaking down gender barriers. And we like to shock people, too. Mrs. Knopf, I found out from you that you've been doing a show in one form or another for nine years now. What? What keeps you going? Oh, a lot of things keep me going. The fame. Mm -hmm. The fortune. Mm -hmm. um, I love to help people with little minor problems. I mean, they're psychiatrists for major problems. Mm -hmm. But you know, there's, there's things that come up in all of our lives every day that we just don't know how to deal with. Mm -hmm. Hang now. Ain't that it. It's true. Why do we have them? Hasn't evolution gotten past this point? I but that's what I like to talk about. Mm -hmm. Minor things, sometimes major, but just, you know, trivial facts. Well, Mrs. Knopf, when you have an afternoon off, let's say you're painting your nails or whatever, do you get to watch Manhattan Cable and see the other shows? I love television. I love every show. And of course, I watch Manhattan Cable.
table, there's a different reason why each person has their show. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's for political reasons, sometimes it's just for purely entertainment, sometimes it's for, for entertaining and political reasons, and I love cable because we give us our chance to express our emotions and our artistic ability in every way possible. Isn't it true, everybody? Isn't it true? <laughs> read a review of the show, the series in the Times, and this woman, the London Times, this woman had the, her name is Kate Muir, and she, she had the nerve to say that when Brits love to feel superior, all they have to do is switch on the television and watch American TV, and all I have to say about that is when we want to feel superior, we turn on the television and watch, it's a knockout, anything with Penelope Keith, um, go on, Benny Hill, go Benny on. Hill, Benny Hill, uh, either that or go to England and uh, try and call up Victoria Station for train information to the continent to find out that Victoria Station only has one operator who is busy all the time. And you have to, you know, no matter what you do, you have to stand in line for hours just for anything. We don't have to do that here. You're not a gourmet cook, are you? Not really. Well, you won't you try the new range of Philadelphia dip and sauce? That sounds different. It is. It's from the Philadelphia brand, but it's an entirely new culinary experience. What are we having? Well, we're having the garlic as a dip. How oh, exciting. And then I'll transform the onion and herbs into an exotic and tantalizing sauce. Oh, no. That's cool, so You are adventurous. Well, I have been abroad, you know. <laughs> This is the best thing to leave Newcastle for London since Gaza. Fortunately, it comes back up to six times a day. Minerates can save you money on your J registration new car. Order your new model now, and Minerates guarantees you an unbeatable trade-in price, locked until August the 1st. The depreciation on your present... Hello, I'm Laurie Pike, and we're back. Later on in the program, we're going to be talking to some of the stars of Manhattan's three public access channels and finding out what it is that floats their boat, bakes their cake, and lifts their skirt. But first, with these clips. The city is in fear. Danger. We don't have enough money for cops. Violence all around us. I'm afraid to walk the streets of New York as you are. And yet I see in the newspaper uh, West Side Sweep of John, of John's net off-duty cop. What, what's a John? A John is a guy who rents a pussy and puts his dick in that pussy. There's no jewelry stolen, no tourist from uh, a Utah is stabbed, no one is hurt, no one else is violated. The pussy that John's dick is in has been paid for, it's rented. Yet we have politicians, Dinkins and the rest of them, will spend time, spend time busting, busting John's while this city is unsafe. It is what I've learned in all the years I've published Screw and been involved with Midnight Blue. The hypocrisy, the brain deadness of this, and it offends me. It should offend you. So what I have to say is all those responsible for Operation John, and what happened? 64 Johns were arrested. Were you safer? Were the muggings lessened? Were the murders declining? Because 64 guys who were paying for pussy were arrested. No. This is a city filled with hypocrisy. Carvalho O'Connor is full of shit with his vision of, of sins. It's not fucking. This city is unsafe and burning to the ground, and the police in New York City are arresting Johns. So, New York City... Dinkins, go fuck yourself. John! I'm starving! Please feed me my sack! Oh! John! John! What?
Game Weekly magazine outreach took us on a tour of some homo free zones in New York City. In the New York press, I'm always accused of being so damned homocentric. So I thought this would be a great opportunity to give equal time to all of those people who just can't stand dykes and fags and all of their gross behavior. This is the queer haters guide to the very best in homophobia that New York City has to offer. Here, the heterosexuality is rabid and the homophobia is just delicious. At any given time at night, you can find the patrons yelling at people passing by, calling them queer or dyke or fag. And any time nearby, you can see a bashing or two. Oh, it's just in good fun. A broken rib here, a black eye there. Everyone's just out to have a wonderful good time. Of course, at any given moment, your night could be ruined by queers who are staging some sort of protest. This happens a lot while you're strolling down the street and they just wreck your evening. Not to worry. The New York City Police Department will take care of it. Prone to verbal assault and violence a lot of the times, too, the police love to throw fags and dykes around. Anytime you're in trouble, just dial 911. But the flashiest, most ornate, most magnificent show of homophobia in town is here at St. Patrick's Cathedral. Regularly, Cardinal O'Connor whips the congregation into a wonderful, fabulous, anti-gay frenzy. Now, just because he wears a dress, don't think he's playing out some sort of sick fantasy. Well, that was a little morsel, just a taste of all the wonderful and abundant homophobia you can find here in New York City, the fabulous playground of hate. Like a priest coming to your 